higher rates might be here to stay unless inflation comes down. That's according to Austin Goolsbee, Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago president. This comes after Rafael Bostic, Federal Reserve Bank of Atlanta pres, striking a similar tone this week. He's calling for the Fed to hold off until the third quarter. That's counter to what markets are expecting, which is rate cuts starting in March. But that probability is down nearly 10 percent from the start of this week. Cameron Dawson, New Edge Wealth Chief Investment Officer, is here to tell us more on what to expect from the Fed and how that impacts our portfolios. Cameron, great to have you here with us this morning. First and foremost, let's start there. What is the read-through from even the movement, the announcements that we've seen in the Fed speak this week and, and how that could directly correlate into someone's portfolio even right now? Yeah, I think the Fed isn't willing to call victory on inflation yet, meaning that all the Fed speak has talked about needing to see more evidence before wanting to engage with rate cuts. The Fed is concerned that if you've seen things like financial conditions now be easier than they were when they started cutting rate or started hiking rates, that this could actually restoke inflation or cause growth to pick back up even further. And so the Fed does not want to claim that victory. It doesn't mean that they won't cut rates in 2024. It just means that they don't want to signal a big, huge easing cycle, which could be considered stimulative, mostly if growth holds up. So what we think that that means for portfolios is that there's an upward bias to yields. Yields move very far, very fast to the downside over the course of the fourth quarter. And we thought that there's probably upside to those yields because growth was holding in better than expected. Look at those retail sales today. So it means that we can't be complacent on inflation and we can't be complacent on the path of this expect expectation of ever lower yields. Cameron, for investors out there trying to figure out what exactly the Fed's next move means for their portfolio, how much of the focus should be on the timing of that first rate cut versus the pace of the cuts that we could see play out for the rest of 2024? I think it's the latter, which is that it's how many cuts. It's not necessarily a big deal if it comes in March or if it comes in May. I think the only thing about the timing would be a reflection of how much urgency that they thought that they needed to cut rates. If they decided to cut in March, maybe the market would look and say, is the Fed seeing something that we're not seeing, meaning that they're cutting because they feel that they really need to get going on a cutting cycle. That's not at all how the Fed has been talking lately in this pushing back against market pricing. So our view is that the Fed likely cuts three times in 2024. That would be consistent with other non-recessionary cutting cycles, times like 2019, 1998, 1995. Anything more than that likely requires a larger deterioration in economic data and a deterioration in the employment market, which still remains pretty firmly tight. Does the continued anticipation of a cut just lead to a furthering of a drift higher in tech? Yeah, I, it's a great question because if this was a year like 2022, we'd say that a tighter Fed should be bad for tech. But a year like 2023, we saw a huge tech multiple expansion, even as the Fed was tighter than expected and real rates rose. So tech really is benefiting from things outside of the Fed's impact. And it really comes down to the earnings line. Tech has had some of the best earnings revisions higher of really the best earnings revisions higher of any sector within the S&P 500. 500. So the challenge with tech is really this balance or conflict from the reality that tech is a crowded trade. We've seen huge inflows into the tech sector over the course of 2023, where we've had outflows from every other sector. It's also an expensive sector. It's trading just about one term below its 2021 peak. So you're pricing in a lot of good news. But at the same time, you have that earnings revision, which hopefully will make those valuations a little less stressed. You have the earnings momentum and you have the stock momentum. Tech remains in a really strong uptrend on an absolute and relative basis. So for now, we respect the trend. We respect the earnings momentum. But it's another point. We don't want to be completely complacent on that crowded positioning and full valuations. So then, Cameron, outside of tech and outside of what, what you're mentioning and some of the, the fixed income movements that you guys are expecting to see, but more so focusing on equities, where else are you seeing maybe an opportunity to bet on what had been maybe some of those beaten down names that did come back into favor at the end of 2023? 
Yeah, a great example of that would be in healthcare. We're seeing good trends in a turn from earnings deceleration in 2023 for healthcare to a big recovery and growth for earnings for the sector. It actually is expected to have some of the best earnings growth of all the S&P 500 sectors. It's under-owned. You saw big outflows over the course of 2023. You can look at ETF flows, and it looks like it's in contrarian territory, meaning that people have left it for dead. So we're looking for opportunities within health care, it screens more value. Uh, you have a lot of areas that are not trading at very extended valuations, but we also like some of the more growthy parts of healthcare as well. In biotech, given the fact that that entire sector in biotech has been effectively in a bear market for two years, we think that there's opportunity for M&A, capital deployment, mostly if people start feeling a little bit better and more optimistic about the outcome of the Fed and the economy. All right, Cameron Dawson, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Have a great weekend, New Edge Wealth Chief Investment Officer. Thanks. Thank you.